All right, so uh, my name is Andrew Balmos. I'm a research, uh, a graduate research student at Purdue University in the Oates Group, uh, student of Professor uh, Krogmeyer that uh, just gave the talk uh, right before mine. Uh, I'm also, I kind of wear two hats at Purdue, so I'm also a full-time staff member in the College of Ag, which means I, I'm forever going to be a grad student because I can't seem to find time to graduate. But um, I, that's actually, I've been a, a full-time staff member at Purdue more recently in the last just few months, moved to the College of Ag under a project called WIN or the Wabash Innovation Heartland Network, which is um, basically a nonprofit funded by Eli Lilly or the Eli Foundation to the tune of about $40 million to make uh, the area around Purdue University, the epicenter of digital agriculture. So we have test beds and farm, uh, Purdue owned farms, all the way from sort of um, test crop type farms, all the way to normal grain operations for like our animal science uh, um, department. And uh, we're basically trying to build out test beds. We're putting Wi Fi and lower end and anything that might make sense to help attract people to come bring their products or their ideas and do testing at Purdue. And that could be anywhere from just bringing your thing there and getting it on one of our uh, machines. And we have farmers who are staff members who are kind of used to researchers bugging them and getting in their way. They, you know, we try to stay out of their way, but, it's, but uh, they're a little bit more tolerant than most farmers, except maybe Aaron uh, be the exception there, I think. Um, all the, <laughs> no, no, being, yeah, you're one of the few farmers that are tolerant to that, maybe. Um, all the way to maybe a good way to engage research with faculty, uh, maybe using the data. Uh, that your uh, idea or product creates, or maybe even in an innovation space where we help uh, develop the product. So, so uh, the work I'm presenting today is, is, is primarily really an Oats project, but it kind of falls under both a little bit, and so that's my plug for win, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, move on to the talk now. So, uh, well, the title of the talk is uh, How Farmers Will Learn to Stop Worrying and Love Decentralized Distributed Data, so I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Strangelove, so it's kind of a play on that. But it's kind of a real thing. I think uh, really what the talk is challenging, and you'll see at the end that I, we're, we're still working on this, still an active research topic. Hopefully it's, uh, it'll be a thing here soon because that means I graduated. <laughs> but uh, it's really challenging how do we think of uh, networking and trying to, to flip it on its head or, or go, uh, we have this really traditional model and, we, and we've pushed that out to uh, um, uh, kind of as far as we can and we have some societal problems, I guess, in rural broadband that's, that's not coming along. And so can we flip the way we think of networks and the way we build, of net, build networks to, to still have uh, you know, successful IoT uh, while we're waiting for uh, rural broadband and those types of issues to catch up, right? So it may not be the only way, it may not even be the right way, but it's uh, a start of a, d a new framework of thinking. So the, the problem, uh, the desire, really, for IoT, I guess, and this is really um, uh, you know, maybe an overstatement, but in general it's like I want to put sensors out in the field, I want to put sensors on my machinery, I want to put sensors on my, my farm and my silos and all those types of things. I want to get the data to the cloud. And we've been in the mindset of how do we just get it to the cloud as fast as possible? Right? We're trying to build networks to do that. And then the cloud will, cloud or, or, you know, maybe it's not a cloud, maybe it's a piece of software at your farm, but either way the data comes in kind of automatically, gets processed, you get insights, and that comes back down to you as the farmer to make decisions, right? The problem is, <coughs> Cell network, which is the primary tool, and, and to be fair, there are some other solutions, existing solutions, we'll look at them in a second and we'll see why maybe these aren't quite there yet either. But the primary tool to do this is cellular technology, <laughs> right? But this is the state of, well, it's just a piece of the state of Indiana and all the dots are cell towers. This data was collected sort of crowdsourced style from a, a, a site called cellmapper.net. So the red dots are ones where they uh, have less confidence in uh, knowing everything there is to know about it, but um, if it's a dot, it's pretty well likely it's a cell tower, right? They just may not have the exact type of antenna that's on there or the, the, region, the region that it's broadcasting at or the frequent, maybe he doesn't know all the frequencies that are available. But in general, that's kind of the, the cell tower distribution in Indiana, at least for Verizon. We can put uh, AT&T on there uh, and basically the map does, coverage doesn't really change that much. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, in this case here, this is West Lafayette, that's where Purdue is uh, located. It's kind of, uh, it's a population center, of course, for Indiana. It's maybe like in the middle. Down here is Indianapolis, which is, of course, our, our primary population zone in Indiana. Up here is Fort Wayne, that's kind of somewhere a little bit bigger than West Lafayette, but small, or Lafayette area, and, but smaller than Indianapolis. And then there's Kokomo, which is kind of on the same order, maybe, of Lafayette, West Lafayette area. Those are kind of where the towers are located, if you look closely, right? 
The rest of the towers, they're all on our highways. So it makes sense, the, Verizon, or the Verizons and AT&Ts of the world, they're covering the population centers where there's a market to sell cell connectivity, and then they're putting the towers on the, on the highways so that your phones work while you drive around. Now they're also kind of double dipping, so they're gonna put these, these towers that are on the highways, they're gonna put them in small towns as well, so they can kind of cover the small towns too, right? And so they, they kind of get a little of extra out of it. But the big problem is that there's huge regions of Indiana that have no towers, and this is just a small part of Indiana, and it's not just Indiana, it's all of the rural America for the most part. The business model is just not there for them to invest in cellular towers when there's not the market for people to buy plans. Now, that might get fixed. My guess is one day the cell towers will be there if IoT and ag really takes off because then there'll be a market, but IoT and ag probably won't take off until it's fixed, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, and that's part of what this solution is to do. Can we, can we get ag and IoT happening without cell? Encourage that uh, to, to build out better and be, and be more reliable. So there are some practical solutions you can do today. Um, so if we have these cellular uh, connections from, the, you know, from our weather stations and our, our field sensors, our tractors and combines, and they have cell connections that are, are unreliable, right, we'll say, at, at, at best, maybe. We can go ahead and install a LoRaWAN gateway. Uh, LoRaWAN is a, a cool uh, technology. It uh, is um, very low power, although it kind of depends how you use it. If you flood data through it as fast as in code, it's not really, ne one of the ways it's low power in the same way that BLE is low power is the use cases for it are to send small amounts of data so the radios can stay off a lot of the times, right? But nonetheless, you can buy um, LoRaWAN gateways that are solar panel. They just mount on a box or you know on a pole somewhere and uh, you can put a cell modem in them so you can locate them somewhere where there might be decent cell coverage in your area. And then it can uh, provide uh, uh, connectivity over a pretty large region, so um, most of the literature out there on there suggests at least six miles. Um, of course, the farther you go, the lower the data rates are, right? Um, but even if six miles isn't enough, you can just kind of drop more gateways around your farm, and they automatically mesh, or that's the promise at least. And then you can keep putting these six zone little or six mile little bubbles all over, so you cover your farm. And these gateways aren't all that expensive, at least in terms of uh, maybe the value that they could provide. The biggest problem, though, is that they're a pretty low bit rate, like 30 kilobits a second. That's like dial-up speed, right? That's like good dial-up speed. And so it's great for small sensors, right? Uh, if I have once per day soil sensors, maybe I even have thousands of them. Maybe one day we actually achieve the like, you know, one dollar soil sensor that we can put all over the place, put Warland radios on them. Warland would be great for this. It's, it's, it's perfectly happy to have hundreds and hundreds of sensors connected to it, as long as they're only sending a couple bytes like once a day. Then there's enough bandwidth, right? Uh, or if maybe I have a weather station, so the weather station has some edge computing on it. So it's uh, maybe taking data once per second, but it's averaging it, it's computing some statistics, and only once an hour does it report you the statistics, you don't get the, the full data set. Now, that's useful, but it's not everything, and, we, and you can imagine wanting to have models where we need more uh, fine data than that on the weather to help uh, our predictions for next year, or what are, what, how are we gonna manage the fields. You, um, you can still use things like alerts though, right? So maybe I have an alert, <laughs> not windows, <laughs> wind, it's over 30 miles an hour, uh, then that sends an alert. Again, that's like a byte or two, right? So it's very small, it's unlikely to happen very often, it's great for LoRaWAN, or um, a great use case for it. But if I still want all the data, what if I want to put a video camera on my harvester so I can capture that video evidence? Maybe there's some uh, cool AI that, we, that, we, that can process the video for us, right? Or what if we want the full can stream for, for for after the season sort of processing to make better predictions for next year, better plans, or what if we need the full one second logs of the weather stations or the soil moisture sensors and things like that. So we're still back to like needing another connection. Right? And so there's always the good old sneaker net, which I think is what farmers are used to right now, right? I mean, maybe the last few years it's gotten a little bit better, uh, but in general you kind of go out, manually collect the memory cards from the sensor systems or the monitors, things like that, drive back to your farm, put them on your computer, copy the data off, use award-winning UI software to copy the data and open it and look at it, right? 
And then hopefully you remember to drive back to the tractor in the sensor, plug that monitor or that memory uh, card back into it. And you're kind of praying at that point everything still works because if it doesn't, you're probably not the right person to fix it, right? You're a farmer, you're not the IT guy. But yet you're the one out there interacting with the thing. So it's not really the right uh, model. So really what we're going to propose is a new, uh, a very old idea, but kind of in a new uh, um, um, perspective. So vehicle to vehicle networking, except we're trying to replace you being the one driving around with the memory card to that sort of happening automatically. As the vehicles move around, the memory card sort of virtually moves between the vehicles and gets where it's supposed to go, right? We have to really think about networking differently here, though, because you're not going to have these connections. You're not going to have a device connected to the cloud where they can have low latency communication anymore. Right? But if we change the way we write our applications or we think about data flow, we can still get a lot of use out of it. So as a thought experiment uh, to try to kind of understand or appreciate how something like this might work, let's just think about uh, wheat harvest in Colorado. So we obviously do a lot of research on uh, the farms of people who are in the group. So Professor Cromer has a family farm in Colorado. Uh, we've for many years put uh, GPS trackers into all their equipment, and so we have kind of good sets of GPS as of, um, of, of wheat operations, so it's kind of what we're going to focus on. And in general, there's a couple of combines, I think usually in their uh, operation there's two in a field at a time. Uh, there's usually a grain cart. That grain cart tenders grain back and forth between the combines and a semi on the side of the road, right, or actually multiple semis usually. And those semis go back and forth to the town. Uh, well, well, they're either sitting on the side of the field waiting to get loaded or they're driving, uh, driving somewhere. And that's the key. Remember, we just talked about the cellular network was good at towns. It was good on the roads. It was good on the highways. It was good at little population centers. It's just not good at the field. Well, here we have a vessel that's driving back and forth, at least in this operation, between the field and those areas where there is good cell connectivity. Or maybe there is a fiber in a small town because because of uh, you know, some uh, federal government or you know, a program to try to bring, to help solving this rural broadband, right? They're pulling fiber out to some of these areas. Or maybe uh, if this uh, sort of protocol worked well, the elevators would, would invest in bringing internet connectivity there because they're also not, take, they're not just taking your grain, they're helping transport your data too, right? So the idea is can we get the data onto that truck and let that truck bring it to town? It extends to more than just harvesting operations, right? You're going to drive around and scout your farms, right? So put, so put the radio on your truck, your pickup truck while you drive around. You can pick up data when you're out there. Uh, uh, you know, in all your operations, you put it on all your vehicles, you're spraying, you're tilling, all those types of things. It can be collecting data the whole time and bringing it, and all those vehicles can bring it back. So in this scenario, we're going to imagine there being Frank, the farmer, and he's kind of the ballet master here kind of coordinating the logistics. Now this Frank may not always be here as an actual person, right? Probably Frank's in one of the pieces of equipment. And probably these guys know what they're doing enough that they're not like actively communicating like what's the next step, right? But there is kind of a plan that they follow, right? They, 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 they react to situations sort of based on um, some rules that they've established. And so the thought experiment is, what if we just put radios in all these vehicles? I don't care about connectivity at this point. I don't, I don't want to think about how do I get it to the cloud. I just want to put radios on the vehicles, and what can we do with that, right? So it could be Wi-Fi, ZigBee, LoRa. It doesn't really matter at this point. Uh, there's just point-to-point -point radios in all the vehicles. And then when we do that, we realize, okay, anything that has, it's hard to see on the slides, or on the monitor there, but anything where the bubbles are touching, those things can talk to each other. Right, so that's, that's an, an improvement from what we had before. And, uh, uh, and so just taking that, we said, well, let's put this out in the field. Let's, let's just see what would happen if we put Wi-Fi on vehicles. What type of connectivity would we get? Let's just test the feasibility of it. So a few years ago, we put tablets into the uh, two combines in the field and one and an ISO blue, which is a, a single board Linux uh, computer, basically, that we've designed to put into tractors to uh, provide computing and, and measure or look at the can and things like that. And ISO Blue's in the grain cart. And then we took Ubiquiti hardware, which is a sort of commercial Wi-Fi. You can just buy it off the shelf. I'd say it's kind of like top of the line home grade, mid-tier commercial grade kind of type hardware. It's not super expensive, but it's not just the cheapest thing on the shelf either. And we put them uh, on each of the three vehicles. Uh, this product that Ubiquity sells is they they um, they call it mesh. 
Uh, we didn't really configure it in a mesh configuration, but we used some of its ability to, uh, w w basically what it did was each uh, Wi-Fi access point on each vehicle broadcast a local 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. That's what things are supposed to connect to, so your phone could connect to that in the same way your phone would connect to the AP in this room. And then they also used the, their 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi to connect to each other. So the, then that acted as the backhaul. So if I had a tablet in the vehicle, it was connected to the Combine, uh, the Joe 2388, 2.4 gigahertz network. It could then talk to uh, Joe 2090, or 290 by the data going over the 2.4 to the Joe 238 uh, Wi-Fi, and then from that Wi-Fi over 5 gigahertz to the, the grain carts Wi-Fi, and then from that 2.4 back to the tablet or to the ISO blue that's in the vehicle, right? So we just kind of threw them out there and said, let's just run weight tests as fast as we can and see what we can get. This is the GPS tracks of where we were, where we were when we collected this data. So you can see it's uh, you know, four or five fields worth of data or so. And these are the results. Basically, uh, we were seeing throughputs in the order of like 20 or 30 megabits per second. So we're about 1,000 times faster than the lower end solution. And there's actually, uh, uh, I believe, uh, reason to believe that that's kind of artificially low, we'll get to in a second. The big thing here though, the really important one is that at about 2.5 miles, 2.5 miles, a quarter of a mile, 0.25 miles, uh, we still are seeing connectivity in that basic uh, speed range where, where even when we're really near, right? So at a quarter of a mile, we still have really good Wi-Fi connectivity. At a half a mile, we're still seeing, now it's kind of trending down at this point, so we're starting to see the edge of what Wi-Fi can do, right? But we're still getting decent connectivity. And the density of these dots, don't, don't be fooled, it's just that it's not very likely that they're very far apart, right? So, so the, the density here is smaller just because they're not often that far apart, so there weren't as many opportunities to take measurements there. So the real point is that over the kind of the whole range of distances that these vehicles get from each other during this wheat harvest, we've got reasonably good Wi-Fi connectivity, right? They don't tend to get far enough apart that the Wi-Fi doesn't work anymore. That's, a, that's kind of the main point. This is the five gigahertz. If you're using the 2.4 as your backhaul, you'd expect maybe even slightly larger range, just give attenuation. So let me be clear, this plot over here has nothing to do with Wi-Fi, that's just the GPS coordinates of all the vehicles subtracted to compute distances. So this is just over all, over the, all that testing, the, very, the different um, um, times, the probability that a vehicles are a certain distance away from each other. Right? So the density of these plots should kind of go with the, the height of this plot. Uh, so then if you look at just the throughputs and the kind of the probability of seeing a certain amount of throughput, and by the way, this is not the bit rate of the, of the physical layer, right? The Wi-Fi, this, isn't, this is actual data throughput. Right, so we tested this by having IsoBlue serve a big file over HTTP. The tablets would just download it, and we we measure how long it would take to download that so that file. Right, so so uh, when you're comparing apples to apples, you have to be sure you're looking at real data rate and not the bit rate of the physical layer. Right. Uh, turns out the tablets we were using are kind of old, and the chipset built into them, they don't know how to do modulations over over. Uh, about like, I think it's 28.8 mega, megabits per second or something like that. So there's a good chance that actually we were seeing much, we could have seen much better speeds. Uh, we just didn't use hardware that could achieve it. Okay, so back to the story. Uh, we need to think about, okay, well, how does mobility then affect this? So if I put these radios on the devices and, they can, and if they're close enough, they can talk. And we sort of just shown that's kind of field scale. So for the most part, they are close enough to talk. But the vehicles move around, right? And so we need to be able to handle the fact that at some point they will move too far away, at least for a little while, and they can't talk and they'll come back. And so, I mean, the, the, the effects are kind of obvious, but it's useful to look at. You get a partition, right? So if these two combines move too far away, then they can still talk to each other with no problem. And these three, or well, really the, the, the grain cart and the semi can talk to each other with no problem. And there's really actually a third partition because Frank can't see the semi. Right, so Frank and the grain cart have formed a partition. A little, got the coloring got a little weird there. So, but it's important to realize that it's not just okay. I can't see anyone. Sometimes I can have these sub partitions where I'm, I can maybe see a few people, but not all of them. So, just thinking about okay, how can we fix that with current technology that already exists? We asked, can mesh networking help? Turns out Wi-Fi actually has in its standard uh, ability to do mesh networking. It's called 802.11s. It's 
kind of supported by chipsets. You can find chipsets that support it well, and you can find ones that don't, so we carefully picked ones that do support it. And if you're not familiar with what meshing is, it's kind of a simple concept, although um, it has a lot of details that are actually kind of hard to solve, right? But we'll ignore them because 802.11s has solutions for them. They may not be the best in the world, but they have solutions. And here, again, the point was to put commercial hardware on vehicles and just see what would happen, right? So uh, if, what we mean by mesh is if vehicle one wanted to talk to vehicle three in this case, but it can't actually see vehicle three, but vehicle two is in the middle and it can see both, then the, the, the protocol can, or vehicle one can send a message to vehicle two. That message basically says, hey, this message is really for vehicle three and I know you can see him, so can you hand it on to him for me and tell him it was from me? And then again, vehicle three could respond to vehicle one in the same way backwards, right? So with a tool like that, now all of a sudden, as the vehicles uh, spread apart in the field, uh, we still have, we have complete connectivity, right? I mean, it's still possible to form partitions, but like in this case, if the, this combine wanted to talk to the semi, they could hop messages through this combine, through this grain cart, up to the semi. They could maintain connection, right? As they move around, it's possible that you form these partitions, so that's still a, prob a problem we have to deal with. But given the kind of the size of a field, and of course that varies a lot too, right? But, and what we saw with connectivity, it's pretty rare that we're gonna see these partitions, right? So maybe we can just deal with them when they happen and, and it not affect the problem, to, or the, uh, affect the product too much. So we set out to test it again. This time we built a new box. It looks a lot like an ISO Blue. It's kind of basically an ISO Blue. Um, it's got a bigger processor in it, and basically we just made sure that the computer isn't the reason that we are going to be limited in our ability to measure the rate, right? That was its, the primary purpose. We use the same hardware. It's this Ubiquiti device, and uh, it's using uh, it's off-the-shelf hardware, but I flashed open source firmware onto it because Ubiquiti uh, does something proprietary. In fact, it kind of actually appears that it maybe it's actually just running OpenWRT underneath, but it's a little hard to configure, so we just flashed up OpenWRT, which is a very popular uh, Wi-Fi firmware, and configured them for 802.11s and just kind of let the protocol work on its default settings. Uh, and then once per second, we ask each Wi-Fi node what peers it can see, and that's something that the, the, the protocol maintains anyway, so I'm not really asking the network to do anything extra. I'm just asking for it to tell me what it, what it knows. And then once every 15 seconds, we do a 10 second long rate test where we try to push as much data as possible between two devices. The five seconds uh, that are not accounted for, the machines all uh, kind of communicate back to one master node, and the master node decides which two machines are going to test at this point, and they sort of coordinate in that five second frame. And that was an attempt to uh, make it so that we had a, a data set that was sort of sampled over distance more uniformly, right, so that we didn't have that kind of weird density problem we saw in the first plots. Turns out that uh, while um, our farmers are really helpful, they don't always remember to unplug things that aren't that important for them, and so they get left on at night a lot, which is okay, except that all night long they're speed testing uh, every 15 seconds, and they're all in the same exact spot, so all of a sudden in one night there's, there's like thousands of tests at one distance bin and none at the other, and then that really kind of screws up the distribution when, when you look at it um, for tests in the field. But nonetheless, we're getting the data, right, but we might still have this sort of un ununiform uh, shape to it. And then there are cell modems in the box, primarily so I can remote log into them. We're, this is a ASREC. It's a farm right north of Purdue. It's right next to Purdue. It's got very good cell connectivity there. Um, and so we might as well log cell connectivity, and so that's kind of running in the background as well. So it's currently on two semis, a combine and a grain cart. And so there's one box sort of in each vehicle. And then if you look carefully, each vehicle has uh, one of those ubiquity Wi-Fi access points mounted somewhere on them. I like the one on the combine because when you're standing out there, it just stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, it, it just doesn't, you know, it looks, uh, it looks different. So with all that, so, uh, oh, well, I guess I should say, it's literally running right now, so I don't have any results. How do you, I don't use a Mac, uh-oh. What'd I do? There we go, there we go. So they're currently out there, so there's a semi uh, at the farm right now, a grain cart, or, and the combine in the field. Uh, it's probably, I don't know what time it is there. They, for the last about hour, they haven't been moving. I promise they do actually move in real time. But, 
he says, I'm showing you a demo, they decided to stop. Uh, <laughs> there's also a fourth semi uh, that's not on here because the stupid plug for uh, cigarette lighter never works and it keeps breaking. And so uh, when I get back, I'll have to fix it again. So uh, we don't really have any results from here other than I can tell you by looking at the data kind of haphazardly, uh, connectivity is pretty good. In fact, it's really hard to find a time where they can't all see each other. It's, uh, it's like that, that scenario right there is kind of the only time it, that, that they don't when the semi is driven away from the field. And data rates go all the way from like a megabit to se a second to hundreds of megabits a second, like three, four, five hundred megabits a second. But we'll have more results there. So given all of that, uh, why, right? So we kind of established we could build this network. Well, what's some use cases for it? I think there's lots and lots and lots. We sat down in a room together and just kind of thought, what could we do if the machines could talk to each other? Uh, we'd have a list a mile long, right? But here's a couple just to sort of motivate the problem. Uh, if the combine could share the yield map, its current fill state, and its heading with the grain cart, the grain cart could compute where it should go. So instead of chasing it around the field the wrong way and then picking the wrong one and the other combine had to stop because it was fuller, right? It could just drive to the right spot in the field and wait for the combine to get to it. And when the combine gets there, it'll be basically full and ready to unload, right? It could make the, the tendering job of the grain cart faster and more efficient and we use less fuel, all sorts of things like that. And there's no human intervention needed here, right? If the monitor could just say, hey, drive here and stay. Uh, there's another one. Frank, if Frank knew uh, the yield maps and he knew past weight tickets from, uh, from semis that I've already dumped load from that field, it could make a, be a better actionable decision about what it should do with the semi. Should the semi come back to the field? Should it go to the next field? Or maybe they're done for the day and, and he can be sure, yep, the what's left in the field is going to fit in the semi I have on the road. You might as well just go home. Right? These are decisions I think right now. I'm not a farmer, so... So I'm, I'm taking from other people, but they kind of, you know, climb up, look down in the, in the semi and go, eh, it looks like it'll fit, right? Which I'm sure when it doesn't and the semi's not on the field, then it's kind of a big deal, right? So, so there's lots of uh, reasons, but this kind of, this one here brings up, well, wait, if the semi drove away, then I can't talk to it anymore. So how do I know the weight tickets that it has, right? And that's kind of the motivating uh, uh, problem of the next step. And it says, well, what if we just put storage in all the vehicles? So not just a radio, but a large uh, storage space. Storage space is insanely cheap, right? We can put enough storage space in all these vehicles, at least maybe the, the vehicles. I'm, I'm probably not going to put a terabyte hard drive on a soil sensor, right? But it's certainly on the vehicles where we could probably store a whole season's worth of data, no problem, right? And there's no, uh, uh, and so if we, if we assume we've put our storage space onto the vehicles, what can we do then? Well, we can build this network where all the data generated by one device just gets pushed to the other one. And then that device pushes all the data that it learned from the first one and all of its data to another one. And then that one does the same thing again and again and again, right? And in this scheme, and I, we're going to talk about how maybe a protocol, you know, design a protocol that could achieve this, but let's just imagine that we had one right now. All the data would kind of be everywhere, right? And eventually that truck drives away, drives away with grain in its bed and bits in its hard drive. And when it gets to connectivity, it could be that just cheaper connectivity or just connectivity at all, depending on where you are, it can then uh, move not just its data, but also all the data of all the other vehicles. Right. Uh, and then uh, the same thing kind of applies going backwards. So the cloud may have processed things and have new knowledge that it wants to share with Frank. Maybe Frank doesn't have good cell service right now, so it shoved it onto the semi when it was available. The semi drove back to the field. It passes the data on to Frank, but also to the grain cart and the other combine. And, and in this case, you know, we have a partition. So, uh, oh, I skipped something. So, so we'll back up one second. So this is an important thing here. So we've just created a loop, and in most networking technologies, a loop is awful, right? Loop brings networks down, right? So we'll just, I don't have a, we have a solution for it. I won't think about it right now, but remember, let's just remember that we have this loop we need to deal with. And, and if we design the protocol right, actually the loop's not a big deal at all, right? But we have to be careful to make sure we design the, the protocol right. Uh, but it has some benefits. Since I have a loop here, this, con this uh, grain, uh, combine here, it can get the data that the semi just shared from two different sources now. So if I make the protocol smart, I can uh, kind of share the burden of, of moving that data around. 
right? That becomes really important when you start thinking, when you start thinking I'm going to add soil sensors and weather stations and all of my other type IoT sensors into this network, right? Uh, that, that having this sort of multiple paths, that, then it can uh, sort of eagerly push the data, right? So we can also have partitions, but that's not a big problem because eventually the combine comes back into connection and uh, this protocol is going to be stateless and so it doesn't really care that it wasn't there when the data first arrived. It's there now and it gets it, when it uh, from storage on the other vehicles, right? So some observations from that. We started with mesh because, well, it's available. You can just install it right now. But really one of the things that you uh, observe if you look at it is we don't really need meshing capabilities. This storage on each device uh, allows us to just think of the network as a solely peer-to-peer -peer thing. The only thing that the network's ever doing is moving data from one node to another node that it can directly talk to. Once we have that, because they all have storage, you sort of get the meshing for free because the data then moves from that node to the nodes it can see. Right? That's actually a, a really good positive thing because uh, if you look out there right now, which you can find for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle networking, the standards, uh, most of these uh, wireless protocols, they drop all of the kind of connecting functionality because in their use case, the vehicles are moving uh, by each other quickly. They need to connect. They can't, they can't spend time transferring a session, trading security, you know, encryption keys, and things like that. They just think they have a very small window of opportunity. They need to push the data through as they can. And so basically the standards say, oh, we're not doing any of that. We're just going to push data when we can, and the protocol is going to have to deal with security and, and, and things like that. So it turns out they've actually defined a Wi-Fi version, or a version of Wi-Fi for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity. They call it 802.11p. And in, 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 in some sense, it's basically what I just said. There's no more uh, connecting. There's no more trading of keys or anything like that. But the, fundamentally, the radio works the same, and most chipsets can can, at least with some software changes, can actually implement 802.11p. So if you have Wi-Fi, you can do 802.11p too. There's also some new technologies that have, uh, for a different reason, but similar uh, problems. So you can imagine millimeter wave radios, which are kind of you know, up, up and coming, but they have the promise of being able to transfer huge amounts of data in very short periods of time, which is good because to make those links work, you usually have to have such fine beams that they're only aligned for very short periods of time, and it's really hard when everything's moving, too. So uh, I might only have connection between this millimeter wave radio for, you know, a millisecond out of every second, but in that millisecond I can move terabytes. I mean, my numbers might be wrong there, but, but you know, it's something, that's, that's the promise but I only have a millisecond, so I can't waste any time transferring some session state. I just have to be able to dump data on you when I can, right? So uh, since this protocol that we're talking about uh, has this eventual routing, this capability of like, the network is complete. The semi is a true connection between the cloud and the field. It's just really latent. It's extremely high bandwidth, right? We put all the data on the semi, it shows up in the town, and suddenly all that data is available. It just took three hours, or it took a week, or it took a whole season maybe, but it eventually got there. Right? And, uh, and so that eventual routing allows us to really be able to utilize some of these uh, uh, other technologies correctly. The other uh, thing that we've noticed is the physical layer, the type of radio it doesn't need to be consistent. Right? So we can put our weather station back in, and maybe the weather station's using LoRaWAN, and maybe I put LoRaWAN or just LoRa radios into uh, the truck and the combine because as my truck drives around the farm, I want to be able to pick up all my other little sensors. Right? It doesn't really matter to the protocol. As long as I've defined how this protocol is supposed to interact with LoRaWAN and how it's supposed to interact with Wi-Fi, the interface is that storage on the vehicle. Right? So I can now have data go from LoRaWAN to this truck and then over, over to the combine and Wi-Fi and then over to the grain cart with BLE and then over to the semi over some other radio. Maybe it's a custom 400 megahertz thing. It doesn't really matter from the protocol's perspective as long as we define how the protocol is supposed to use that physical air. So, uh, and then uh, the network isn't really constrained to a local area, and I've kind of touched on this already. It's just a, a little hard to visualize, but before we had this picture where we worried about, oh, we had cell here, and we had lower end there, and all these things, and now we just kind of have this mesh network. The cloud is part of my local field network, right? It's just that the connectivity isn't so good. It's highly late, and I'm waiting for my truck to get there, or I'm waiting for the pickup truck after it scouted the field to get back to the farm for that data to go up, right? But they're all connected. And that, that's, uh, I think, one of the big things. Now, if we um, are going to embrace a network like this, we're going to have to change the way we write software. Right now, software worries a lot about the network. 
It's like, I need to connect to this thing. I need a live session. I want to be able to send the packet. I'm expecting to get data back in a very low, you know, in milliseconds or something like that. And when that doesn't happen, the protocols usually fall apart, right? So what we're sort of suggesting is not just changing how we think of the network, but changing the way we write applications. In this case, the application no longer has to worry about the network. The application is just going to say, and we'll see it a little bit more detail in a second, hey, I want that data, and when someone has it, let me know, right? Now, it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? And we're going to have to change the way we think about software, the way people think how they interact with software, but it really enables a lot of opportunity. So what are the requirements in some of this network? First, it's security first. And I think this is just a requirement anyways, because it's a good practice, right? We should just, we should just always be transferring data over uh, securely. In this case, it's even more important because we're, we're, we're basically enabling you to use any link, any radio, any sort of technology. It's going to be really hard to trust the different radios and different links that your data might be able to flow over when, in practice when you really install this, right? So your protocol, it, your data needs to be encrypted at the, you know, at the foundation and sent in an encrypted way. I, uh, one of the things I want to make sure we you leave this talk with is that all these things I'm saying, there's very little new that needs to be created. A lot of technology is already out there. It's just not been packaged together in this way yet. So uh, I don't want to get into the gory details because, well, we're still kind of getting into it a little bit, and, and I think that would be kind of a boring talk. But so I'm going to show you uh, instead some projects that are out there. Most of these are open source projects that implement the basic functionality that we'll need. Right. So we may not be able to just apply them directly. We might have to just learn from them and, and tweak them slightly. But the technology is already there. So WireGuard is a replacement for VPN. Uh, and it's a much better, it, it, does, it does it very differently than, than VPN and basically fundamentally it just always encrypts the data and it thinks of the peers that it's talking to as their private key. So it doesn't really matter, or their public key, it doesn't really matter what their IP address is that can change in the middle. As long as that packet comes in and it can assert that that thing still owns that public key, then it'll trust it and let the connection complete. So if you've ever done VIP or VPN and you when you're in this room and then you walk to that room and your VPN breaks and you have to log back in, well, you should look at WireGuard because that's my better solution. Of course, you might have to get your IT staff to support it on their end too. Um, the network has to understand uh, link costs. So this is kind of just sitting down and thinking about you know, what are the problems that might come up. And uh, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead for just real, real quick because for a visual, if I have a situation like this where the blue in this picture is BLE, and that BLE is really trying, it's really there for that field sensor, right? But in this case, uh, the, um, the combine and the grain card, it could choose to either use this yellow network, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, or it can use this BLE network. Right? And it would be a bad choice for it to use the BLE network because that BLE network is probably battery powered, probably, and it's probably going to kill the battery if I try to push video through it or something like that, right? I mean, the, the video is probably not going to make it, and I'm going to end up with a dead sensor. The human's going to have to go around and replace the battery. So the network needs to understand, of all these possible links, what are the costs of using them? It's not just uh, actual billable costs like cell plans, but it's energy usage, it's human time, it's available storage. So I may have a sensor that doesn't have a lot of storage, and so it's not a good use. I'm not, I shouldn't push data to it because it's got more important data that it needs to hold, and if I push data to it, I'm going to fill its storage. Right? There's lots of things you might uh, be able to factor into this cost perspective, and, that, and that's going to control how the network works. And then costs don't really mean anything unless you have priorities to make decisions over those costs with. So, and this is kind of the key. This is how you use the network. So a node is going to go to the network and say, I need this type of data and it's this important to me. And that information then will get sent through the network, distributed through the network. So as those nodes start collecting data, it can ask the question of, is the priority of this data somewhere high enough and the cost of this link low enough that it's okay I, that to send data. And if it is, then I'll send the data to that node. There's a little bit of uh, detail in here, though, that, to, to consider, because the priority may be being set by the cloud. And I may be the combine talking to the grain cart right now. I'm not so certain the grain cart knows how to get it to the cloud. So it's not just, does someone need this and is the link cheap enough? It's also, is that the right place to send this data or is there another piece of data that I should send to the grain cart and I'll send this one to the other combine because it's got a better path to the cloud or a less latent path to the cloud, right? So I think, you know, hidden in this 
uh, this, this decision rule should send is a really large complex problem that's probably kind of probabilistic in nature. You're never going to really get it right, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to define rules that make good decisions based on um, observing the network and observing past transactions uh, to try to get the data to flow correctly. So on the bottom here, I've referenced some other uh, projects, mainline DHT, that's distributed hash table. That's what BitTorrent uses to understand what files are available where. Not to store the files, just to know where, what nodes have what files. Apache Cassandra is a huge big data uh, database, right, that, that's, that span, that crosses many nodes, or can, uh, and store lar very large data sets. And Apache Cassandra uses a DHT that's a, its own custom one to control, to understand what data is stored on what machines, so it can find it. And then, I'm not going to even try to pronounce that, uh, Kate, yeah, well, the, the third one. <laughs> I've read about it. I've never heard anyone pronounce it, so I'm not entirely sure the right way to pronounce it. That's kind of a theoretical DHT, if you will, that a lot of times the, these things like BitTorrents and Cassandra's and the many other implementations out there are kind of based on. Right? So we can use this DHT to propagate uh, the priorities, is my point. So DHTs are good to store data in, it kind of propagates, and it understands how to deal with uh, you know, when partitions form and when I might have old data in this partition and new data over here, and how to merge that back together, right? You know, again, there's still a lot of details in there that need to be resolved, but in, in some sense, uh, this priority structure, uh, who wants what data, is kind of small in comparison to all the other data, and so it's okay that that might be repeated and sent repeatedly through this network, right? And then the last requirement is that networks must be able to deal with um, loops, right? And there's really two forms of loops. There's a loop we saw, which is kind of number two here, but there's another one that's a little bit more fundamental. So I'm gonna step back one second, and if we think about this condition here, if my node, every time it sees a new link and a new piece of data, goes, should I send this data down this link? Yes, okay, send it. Well, every time I ask that question, it's gonna say yes, or at least in a short period of time. And my node's just gonna keep sending the same data over and over and over to the node that already has it, right? So that's one form of loop, right? There needs to be some knowledge in the network that, oh, that thing already has the data, I don't need to send it again. That's sort of simple to solve in the context of just me sending it to one of my neighbors, because I can just keep track of what I've done, right? But what if the other, the other loop, which is kind of the harder one to solve, where now I'm sending data to a node that maybe already has that data from a different node, right? And that, was, and that was able to happen because there was a loop somewhere in the network. So basically what we're looking for is trying to have this rule of, you know, we ask the question, is the priority and the cost sufficient to send the data? Have I not already sent the data to it? And does it not already have the data? If, it, if all those things are true, then I'll send it, right? But we still have to figure out how do we answer those questions, right? Particularly the last one, how do we know what the other node that I don't necessarily always have good connectivity to has on it? And what has it gotten from other, other members? And uh, so that kind of comes back to, well, what is this data term that we're making these decisions about? Like, what is that, you know, how do we really practically make that so that we can answer these questions correctly? Turns out this is really hard, right? But it's really important to get right. The whole thing kind of hinges on getting, uh, getting the, nailing exactly how we represent a specific piece of data in the network, right? So um, basically, at the end of the day, it comes down to that our representation of the data needs to be consistent across the network. So they can't have any pre-coordination with each other, but they have to be able then to identify, without sending the entire data file, that it's, on, it's the same data on both sides. Right? So if we can make that representation small, then we can maybe spend the network time to say, hey, do you have this, this ID? And if it says, I already have it, okay, I won't send it. Right? If I don't have it, then I'll send the large data file. And in some way or another, this isn't exactly how all these, these open source projects uh, use this idea, but they all use an idea very similar to this, the need to be able to create an ID for data uh, in a consistent way without um, uh, um, collaboration with the other peers. IPFS is called Interplanetary File System, and solving a problem very similar to what I'm talking about, and except it doesn't kind of automatically push data through the network. You have to kind of know what you want and ask for it. Of course, we've all used BitTorrent before, I think, right? Or I think we have, we've all used BitTorrent. Who hasn't used BitTorrent? Oh, well, we've all heard of BitTorrent before, I think, right? And then Git, if you're a programmer, you've probably heard of Git. Git um, tracks source code. And so every time I sort of commit 
that's the state of the source code to the Git repository. And that's basically what it's doing. It's creating this representation of, of the code, saving it and then naming it in a way that then if somebody else shares their history with me, we can be sure, oh no, these are all the same or, or they're different, I need to merge them. So I think there's a, an easier way to kind of understand this. The, the big idea is something we call content addressing. And it basically comes down to we can't identify data based on where it lives. We have to identify data based on the data. Right? So a good example is if I went to my web browser and went to example.com slash cat.jpg, and I expect to be able to get a cat picture back, right? And the, my browser will use DNS to translate the name example.com to an IP address. And then we've already, we've already hit our first source of uncertainty. Every time I go to a DNS to ask for the IP address of example.com, there's no guarantee that it'll be the same IP address. So if I ask for this URL three or four times, I might get three or four different servers, and they may have, all, they may have three or four different uh, versions of cat.jpg. And that would be fine under the current uh, thinking of, of, of like HTTP and how to, find, how to locate resources. And then, even more fundamentally, if I can somehow detect that, okay, no, I want to only talk to 10.23.5.123, it's under no response, has no responsibility to always give you the same cat.jpg. In fact, we abuse this a lot in web technology, where the same resource, the same URL, the thing that is supposed to, in our mind, represents uh, the data, uh, and I hit it, depending on the context of me going to that URL, I get a different answer back, right? It's actually quite useful in developing applications. It's not so useful uh, in being able to track data. And so uh, basically it comes down to we can't refer to data where it, lit, where it resides, but we have to talk about what it is. So another real life example of this, if you're, if you're um, not following along, is you would never go to a friend and tell them, go to Movies RS, row two, cabinet three, shelf four, third from the right. It's a great movie, you should watch it. That's what we do with HTTP. We said, go to uh, example.com slash cat, it's great, right? But you wouldn't do this in real life, right? You would just say, hey, you should watch Doctor Strangelove. It's a great movie, and it is a great movie, by the way. Uh, and the, the difference, and, and, and the reason we would do that is, is because if I tell you you should watch Doctor Strangelove, I might go, oh, I've seen it, it's a great movie, and I, I don't have to do anything. And so that correlates back to our network example, right? If something says, hey, you should have this data, and I go, no, I already have it. We don't need to do anything. It could be that I have it in my backpack and I haven't watched it. There's no need for me to go to the movie store, right? I just need to go home and watch it. It could be that my friend has it, and it's a lot easier for me to go get it from my friend than drive to the movie store. In that case for our networking is uh, the data may have come from the combine and the semi wants it, but the grain cart has it and it's closer. So I might as well get it from the grain cart, right? Because I can be sure that the data is the same under this model, right? And so on. Right? So how do we do it in practice? Well, we can take a cryptographic hash of the data, and that hash then becomes its name. And uh, so instead of thinking of it as example.com slash cat, we say that cat picture actually is HKP4 and so on. All right. And the big thing here is if I change anything about the cat picture, the cryptographic hash changes. Right, so if I know, if I don't have the data but I have the name and then someone gives me data and I take a hash of it and the hash is equal to the name I've been looking for, I know I have that data and it doesn't matter where it came from anymore. I can be certain it's the right data, even if it comes from an untrusted party because if they change that data at all, the hash wouldn't be equal to each other. Right? Now there's of course uh, some issues, hash functions aren't perfect, there's collisions, and so there are some security implications to think about here, but in general, uh, you can find cryptographically secure hashes that, that, that the risk of collision is so unlikely that we don't need to worry about it in practice. Right? So kind of the problem is solved then, right? We can answer the, the, the should send uh, question uh, in the same way we were before. And really that's the research project. That's the part that we're still working on is like what is the right way to, 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 to take the priority versus the cost and decide to, to move, use the link and move the data. But we can implement the already sent. That's easy, right? Because I have local storage, so I can just store a, a table of this data's hash and this link, this note, this, this neighbor, and then I've sent it to it before. And so I can do a real quick look up and go, oh, I've already sent it to him, I don't need to even ask him. And if I, have sent, if I haven't sent it to him, then I can send a really simple request to it and say, hey, do you have this hash? Which is usually the hash is much smaller than the data, right? And that uh, remote node can just respond after doing its own little quick look update in a table of saying what 
what hashes do I have available in my local store and say, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And if he doesn't, then we can send him the data. Now we don't have a loot problem anymore, right? Because as soon as that first node sends that, that data to one of the, the, the nodes in the loop, uh, it won't, the other node that has a copy won't try to send it to it anymore because it will respond and say, no, I've already gotten it, right? And it was that hash that was consistent across, that, that we could compute the name of the data with the hash that's consistent at each node without them pre-negotiating anything, right? So there's a kind of implication here, though. So it means like the data has to be immutable, right? Because if I change it, I'll get a new name and then uh, people will still have the old one and then there'll be a new file with, with some changes in it and I'll have to be able to tell the two apart, right? There's nothing really fundamentally wrong with that, so I might be able to build an application layer on top of it that built into the data is the ability to track which is which and I can say, oh, this is just a new version of this other file. So I'm gonna throw that other file away and just use the new one now. There's a downside of that though in that that means I'm copying a lot of data, right? So if I have a gigabyte of data and I add four bytes to it, I've got a whole new file and I have to move a whole gigabyte plus four bytes. And I already had the one gigabyte, so it's kind of a waste. But we can keep building on data structures. We can look at like Git as an example where um, uh, they have built, you, you know, um, mutability on top of immutability by saying when you commit the file, in Git, that means kind of storing in the repository, or in our network problem, means making it available to the network to be pushed around. Just tell me the difference from the last time you've, you've committed that file. Right? So now all we're doing is sending the differences. But to be able to recreate the whole file on the other side, I need all of the little differences. And so there's some downsides, right? I might have 99% of all the little differences, and that one last one is stuck on a node that just is like parked in the shed and isn't gonna move for the next six months, and I can't create this file even though I have 99.9% .9 of the data, right? So there's definitely trade-offs, but none of this it really is important to the network. From the network's perspective of this being able to kind of push data around, it's your choice whether you're gonna push big files or you're gonna push you know, a chain of small differences, right? And so you can make that decision for your application. The big point here is that the, the application didn't have to worry about how that data was gonna move around. All it said was it went to the network and said, hey, I'm interested in yield data. And that set the priority for yield data high to get back to it. And the yield data started flowing in, right? And it didn't care about how that, how that network worked. Um, and, and, and it may have to wait a long time to get the, the full chain or to get that particular file that it's looking for. But the reality is, is that's as fast as we can get the data there anyways, because the connectivity just isn't out there. Uh, so uh, these ideas aren't really new. Git uses it. IPFS actually basically steals Git's model, and that's how it builds immu immutability on its network. Um, so there's a lot of really good uh, already existing technology that can be reused to build this type of stuff. So I think that was it for my talk. Does anyone have any questions? I, I uh, hopefully didn't get too much in the weeds. I think the point, like I said when I started, is really just trying to challenge how do we think about networking, and can we develop a network um, that uh, can uh, function today. We don't have to wait for the world broadband problem to be solved to get something useful out of it. Right? So there might be different ways of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, in, in your in your guys' research, uh, had you evaluated um, the uh, TDY space uh, in UHF and VHF? Yeah. So uh, no. <laughs> We are actually uh, actively trying to get uh, Microsoft's implementation of TV white spaces installed. Um, and when that happens, maybe we can play with it. I think for the perspective of this research, it doesn't really matter. I think it only cares that there is a link, whatever that link is. Yeah. But no, we haven't. It would be interesting to, to play with. Yeah. It's a, a slightly aside, it's actually kind of a hard one to deploy in farms. So from what we've found out so far, it's actually kind of hard to get permission to use the TV white spaces. And even when you do get permission, there's an expectation that you have certain certifications and background uh, before the FCC will let you install it. So you oftentimes have to get like your local internet provider to, to do the installation and the maintenance of it. And, um, I mean, it's a technology, and hopefully it'll get to the point where it's easy to deploy, but it's certainly not like Loraland where you can just throw it out there. Okay. Thank you very much.